Good morning and welcome back to Detroit, Michigan. My name is Savannah Peterson and I'm here on set of theCUBE. My co-host, John Furrier. How are you doing this morning, John? Doing great, feeling fresh. Day two of three days of coverage. Feeling fresh. That is, yes. that, for being in the heat of the conference, I love that attitude. It's going to be a great we'll day today. We'll see you at the end of the day. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> <laughs> we'll hold them to it, all right? Everyone hold them accountable. Very excited to start the day off with an internet legend, as well as a CUBE OG. We are joined this morning by Matt Klein. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Yeah. It's, so, what's the vibe? Day two, everyone's buzzing. What's got you excited at the show? You've been here before, but it's been three years, you mentioned. I, I was saying it's been uh, three years since I've been to a conference, so it's been interesting for me to see oh, wow, what is yeah. what is the same and what is different pre and post COVID, but um, just really great to see everyone here again and uh, nice to not be sitting in my home by myself. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Savannah said you're an OG and we were referring before we came on camera that you were you first came on theCUBE in 2017 second KubeCon event, but you were, I think, on the first wave of what I call the contributor momentum where CNCF really got the traction. Yeah. You were at Lyft, Envoy right. was contributed, yeah. and that was really hyped up, and I remember that vividly. It was day zero, they called it back yeah. then. And you got so much traction, people were totally into it. Yeah. Now we got a lot of that going on now. Right. A, lot of, a lot of day zero events, they call them co-located co events. Um, you got WebAssembly, a lot of other hype out there. What do you see out there that you like? Um, how would you look at some of these other sure. communities that are developing? What's the landscape look like to you as you look out? Because Envoy set the table what is now a standard practice. Yeah, what's been so interesting for me just to come here to the conference is, uh, you know, we open source Envoy in 2016, we donated in 2017, and as you mentioned, at that time, Envoy was, you know, everyone wanted to talk about <laughs> Envoy. And, um, you know, much to my amazement, Envoy is now pervasive. I mean, it's used everywhere around the world. It's like never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined that it would be so widely used. And it's almost gotten to the point where it's become boring, you know? It's just assumed that Envoy is, is everywhere. And now we're hearing a lot about eBPF and WebAssembly and GitOps and, uh, and you know, AI and a bunch of other things. So um, it's, it's actually great. It's made me very happy that yeah. it's become so pervasive, but it's also fun, yeah, as gonna, you mentioned, like, to, to look around at all the other stuff. Like well, I mean, congratulations. It's just a huge accomplishment. Yeah. Really, I think it's going to be a historic, historical moment for the industry, yep. too. But I like how it progressed. I mean, I don't mind hype cycles as long as there's some vetting. Sure, right? of course. <laughs> you know, use yeah. cases that are clearly yep. defined, but you got to get that momentum in the community, but yep. then you start got to get down to business, so, yep. so to speak, and get it deployed, get yep. traction. Yep. What should projects look like? And, and give us the update on Envoy, because you guys have a, a great use case of how you got traction. Take right. us through some of the early days of what made Envoy successful yeah, in your right. opinion. Great question. Yeah, you know, I, I think Envoy is fairly unique around this conference in the sense that um, Envoy was developed by Lyft, which is an end user company. And many of the projects in this ecosystem, you know, no judgment for better or worse, they are vendor backed. Um, and I think that's a different delivery mechanism when it's coming from an end user where you're solving a, a particular business case. So Envoy was really developed for Lyft in a you know, very early scaling days and just you know, trying to help Lyft solve its business problems. So I think when Envoy was developed, we were you know, scaling, we were falling over, and actually um, many other companies were having similar problems. So I think Envoy became very widely deployed because many companies were having similar issues. So Envoy just became pervasive among Lyft peer companies, and then we saw a lot of vendor uptake in the service mesh space, in the API gateway space, among large internet providers. Um, so I, I, I think it's just, it's an interesting case because I think when you're solving real problems on the ground, in some ways it's easier to actually get adoption than if you're trying to yeah. develop it from a commercial and, backing. And that's the class, I mean, almost it's almost like open source product market fit. It is. In its own it, way, because you have a problem, I, absolutely other is. people have the same it's problem. It's finding too, I mean, it's, it's design uh, thinking from a different when perspective. I, when, when I talk to people about open source, uh, I like to tell people that I do not think it's any different than starting a company. I actually think it's all the same problems. Finding pro product market fit, Hiring, like finding contributors and maintainers, like doing PR and marketing, and, and yeah, getting a team together, <laughs> getting traction, getting getting funding. I mean, you have to have money to do all these yeah. things. So, 
I think a lot of people think of open source as, I, I don't know, you know, this fantastic collaborative effort, and, and it is that, but there's a lot more to it yeah, that is much more akin to starting well, a let's, company. Let's just Absolutely. look at that for a second. I think that's a good point. I was having it a is. conversation in the hallway um, two nights ago on this exact point. It's the power dynamics of a startup in the open source, as you point out, is just different. It's sort of community based. So right. there are things you just got to be mindful of. It's not right. top down. Exactly. It's not like, <laughs> right. you know, go, take that hill. It's really consensus based, but it is a startup. You know, all those elements are in play. Absolutely. You need yeah. leadership, you got to have debates, alignment, commit. You got to commit to a vision. Yep. You got to make adjustments, build a trajectory. So based on that, I mean, do you see more end user traction? Because we were talking also about Intuit. They donated um, some of their code, Argo's out there, yep. uh, Argo CD, CD Argo's a service. Where's the end user contributions these days? Do you feel like it's good, still it's healthy? I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm biased, I would like to see more. I think Backstage out of Spotify is a absolutely fantastic. Um, that's an area just in terms of developer portals and developer yeah. efficiency that I think has been very underserved. So seeing Backstage come out of Spotify where they've used it for years and I think we've already seen they had a huge day, you know, day one event um, and I, I think we're going to see a lot more out of that coming if forward. If I'm an end user, I'm just pretend I'm an end user. Yeah. So pretend I have some code I want to, oh man, I'm scared. Right. If I don't, I'm going to lose my competitive edge. What's the, how do you talk to the enterprise out there that might be thinking about putting their project out there for whether it's the benefit of the community, developing talent, developing the product? Sure, yeah. I would say that I, I would ask everyone to think through all of the pros and cons of doing that because it's not for free. I mean, doing open source is costly. It takes developer time, uh, you know, it takes management time, it, it takes budgeting dollars. Um, but the benefits, if successful, can be huge, right? I mean, it can be yeah. just in terms of, um, you know, getting people into your company, getting users, getting more features, all of that. So, I would always encourage everyone to take a very uh, pragmatic and realistic <laughs> view of, <laughs> uh, of what is required to make that happen. What was that decision like at Lyft? When you uh, I, I'm going to be honest. It was very naive. I, I think we that. Yeah, I, I mean, think we really you know? no, just didn't know. I think yeah. a lot of us, myself included, had very minimal open source experience. And had we known, or had I known, what would have happened, I, I still would have done it. But I'm, I'm going to be honest. Um, the last seven years have aged me. What I feel like is like <laughs> seventy or a hundred. <laughs> it's been a but you, like you said, you look out yeah. in the landscape, you got to take pride and look at what's oh, happened. It, it's, I mean, it's like you said, it's it, matured. It's fantastic, I, I would not trade it for anything, but it has it has been a journey. What was the biggest surprise? What was the most eye-opening thing about the journey for you? Um, I, I think actually just the recognition of all of the non-technical things that go into making these things a success. I think at a conference like this, um, people think a lot about technology. It is a technology conference. But open source is business, it really is. I mean, it, it takes money to keep it going, it takes yeah. people to keep it going. You got to sell people it on the takes, concepts. It takes leadership yeah. to keep it going, it, takes, it takes marketing. Yeah. So for me, what was most eye-opening is over the last five to seven years, I feel like I actually have not developed very many, if any, technical skills, but my general leadership skills yeah. you know that would be applicable again to running yeah. a business have yeah. applied so well to, to hey, growing on you put it out there you, yeah. <laughs> you're driving the ship it's good to do that they need yeah. that it really yeah. needs it and the results yeah. speak for itself and congratulations yeah, thank you uh, what's the update on the project give us an update because you're seeing a lot of <coughs> infrastructure people having the same problem sure but it's also the environments are a little bit different some people yep. have different architectures absolutely different yep. more cloud less cloud edge is exploding yeah where does Envoy fit into the landscape sure. big scene? And what's the updates? You got some new things going on. Give the updates on what's going on with the project. Sure. And then how it sits in the ecosystem vis-a-vis -vis what people may use it for. Yeah, so I'm, from a core project perspective, honestly, um, things have matured, things have stabilized a bit. So a lot of what we focus on now are less big bang features, but more table stakes. We spend a lot of time on security, spend a lot of time on software supply chain, a topic that you're probably hearing a lot about at this conference. We have a lot of software supply chain issues. Um, 
we have shipped Quicken HTTP 3 over the last year. That's generally available. That's a new internet protocol. Um, still work happening on WebAssembly. Um, we're ha uh, doing a lot of work on our build and release pipeline. Again, you would think that's boring, yeah. but a lot of people want you know, packages for their Fedora or their Ubuntu or their Docker right. images, and that takes a lot of effort. Um, so a lot of what we're doing now is more table stakes, just realizing that the project is used around the world very widely. Okay. The thing that I'm most interested in is we announced in the last six months a project called Envoy Gateway, which is layered on top of Envoy. And the goal of Envoy Gateway is to make it easier for people to run Envoy within Kubernetes. So uh, essentially as an, as an ingress controller. And nice. Envoy as a project, historically, it is a very sophisticated piece of software, very complicated piece of software, it's not for everyone. And we want to provide Envoy Gateway as a way of onboarding more users into the Envoy ecosystem and making Envoy the, the default API gateway or edge proxy within Kubernetes. But in terms of use cases, we see Envoy pervasively with yeah. service mesh, API gateway, other types of load balancing cases. I mean, honestly, it's, it's all over the place. At yeah. this I'm point. curious, because yeah. you mentioned it's expanded beyond your wildest dreams, yeah. and uh, how could you have even imagined right. what Envoy was going right. to do? Is there a use case or an application that really surprised you? You know, I've been asked that before, and I, it's hard for me to answer that. It's, it's more that, I mean, for example, Envoy is used by basically every major internet company in China. I mean, like, wow. everyone in China uses Envoy. Like, TikTok, like Alibaba, I mean like everyone. All the large it's scale. Everyone, you know, and it's used, it's used in, um, just, it's not just even the US. Yeah. So I, I think the thing that has surprised me more than individual use cases is just the, the worldwide adoption. You know, that something could be, be everywhere. Um, yeah. And that I think, you know, when I open my phone and I'm opening all of these apps on my phone, 80 or 90% of them are going through Envoy in some form. Yeah. You know, it's, just, it's just that pervasive. It's your mind a yeah, little bit sometimes. It, that's it, why it, you it say plumber on your Twitter handle right. as your title, because you're yeah. working on all these things that are like really important substrate issues right. for scale, stability, I, growth. Right. And, you know, to, um, I, I guess the only thing that I would add is my goal for Envoy has always been that it is that boring, transparent piece of technology. Yeah. Kind of similar to Linux. Yeah. Linux yeah. is everywhere, right. but no one really knows that they're using yeah. Linux. It's it's, it's just like there. Intel inside. We're not paying yeah. attention. It's to just there. There's a computer. core group right. working yeah. on it. They have pride. They understand right. the mission, right. the importance of it, and they make their job is to make it invisible. Right. Exactly. And that's yeah. really ease yeah. of use. What's some of the ease of use ways and, and <coughs> simplicity that you're working on? If you can talk about that, because to be boring, you got to be simpler <laughs> yeah. and easier, a goal not to more be boring complex. Is, is unique. Complex I, is not boring. Right. Complex yeah. is stressful. No, exactly. <laughs> I, I think we approach it in a couple different ways. One of them is that because we view Envoy as a as a base technology in the ecosystem, we're starting to see you know not only vendors, but other open source yeah. projects that are being built on top of Envoy. So things like API Gateway, sorry, um, Envoy Gateway, yeah. or you know, projects like Istio, or all the other projects that are out there, they use Envoy as a component, but in some sense, Envoy is a, is a transparent piece of that system. Yeah. So I'm a big believer in the ecosystem that we need to continue to make cloud native easier yeah. for, for end users. I still think it's too complicated. Yeah. And so I, I think we we're, we're, we're pushing up the stack a bit. Yeah, and that brings up a good point. When you start seeing people building on top of things, right. that's yep. enabling. Mm -hmm. So as you look at the enablement of yeah, sure. Envoy, what yep. are some of the things you see out in the horizon? If you get the 20 mile stare out as you, you check these boring boxes, make it more plumbing, right. stable. Yeah you'll have a disruptive enabling platform. Yep. What do you see I, out there? I am, um, you know, I, again, I'm not a big buzzword person, yeah. but so <laughs> some me. people call it serverless, functions as a service, <laughs> whatever. I'm a big believer in platforms in the sense that I really believe in the next 10 to 15 years, developers, they want to provide code, you know, they want to call APIs, they want to use pub sub systems, they want to yeah. use caches and databases, and honestly, they don't care about container scheduling or networking or yeah. load balancing or any of these it's things. Handled in the OS. They, they just want it yeah. to be 
part of yeah. the operating yeah, system. Exactly. So I, I really believe that whether it's in open source or in cloud provider, um, you know, package solutions, that we're going to be just moving increasingly towards systems like AWS Lambda and Fargate and Google yeah. Cloud Run and Azure Functions and all those kinds of things. Um, and I think that when you do that, yeah. much of the functionality that has historically powered this conference, like Kubernetes and Envoy, yeah. these become critical but transparent yeah. components that people don't, they're not really aware of at that yeah, point. And I think that's a great call out because one of the things we're seeing is yeah. the market forces mm -hmm. of of this evolution, what you just said is what has to happen yep. for digital transformation to, to get to its conclusion, yep. which means that everything doesn't have to serve the business. It is the business. Right. You know, IT in the old days, yep. engineers, they serve the business. Like, what does that even mean? Yep. Now, right. developers are the business, so they need that coding environment. So, for your statement to happen, that simplicity, invisibility, calling, this invisible OS has to happen. So, it brings up the question in open source, the trend is things always work itself out in the wash, as we say. So right. when you start having these debates, and the alignment has to come at some point. You can't get to those that state without some sort of de facto or consensus. Yep. And even standards, I'm not a big believer in hardcore standards, but we can all agree and have consensus sure. that we'll align behind, say, Kubernetes. Is yep. Kubernetes a standard? It's not like an IEEE, right. you know, but yep. this next, what, what's your reaction to this? Because this alignment, has to come after debate, so all the projects contending for, I am the this of that. Yeah, I'm a, 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 look, I mean, I totally see the value in like IEEE standards, and, <laughs> and there's a place for that. At the same time, for me personally, as a technologist, as an engineer, I prefer to let the, the market, as it were, sort out yeah. what are the de facto standards. So for example, at least with Envoy, um, Envoy has an API that we call XDS. Um, XDS is now used beyond Envoy. It's used by gRPC, it's used by proprietary systems. And I'm a big believer that actually Envoy, in its form, is probably going to go away before XDS goes away. So in some ways, XDS has become a de facto standard. It's not an IEEE standard. Yeah, right. we, we, we have been asked about whether we should do yeah. that, but um, I just, I, I think the- It becomes a component. It becomes the, a component, yeah. and then I think people gravitate towards yeah. these things that become de facto standards, and I guess I would rather let the people on the show floor decide what are the standards yes. than have you know, <laughs> 10 people sitting in a room it's a, and like totally. trying I to mean, figure it's, it's it out. I mean, it's the community defined standards versus organizational right. and institutional defined standards. And they both have places. 100%, yeah, and, sure. and right. there's social proof in both of them, yep. frankly. Yeah. But. And we were saying on theCUBE that uh, we believe that the developers will decide yep. the standard. Sure. Because that's what you're basically saying. Yeah. They're deciding yeah. what they do with yep. their code. Right. And over time, as people realize the trade, hey, if everyone's coding this, right. and makes yep. my life easier to get yep. to that state of nirvana, and enlightenment, as we would say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Starting strong this morning, John. <laughs> I, I love this. I'm curious, you mentioned uh, Backstage by Spotify, wonderful example. Do you think that this is a trend we're going to see with more end users creating open source projects? like? I, you know, I hope so. Um, the flip side of that, and as we all know, we're entering an uncertain economic time, and um, it can be hard to justify yeah. the effort that it takes to do it well. And what I typically counsel people when they are about to open source something is don't do it unless you're ready to commit the resources. Because um, open sourcing something and not supporting it, yeah. I actually can be think. I think it'd be worse than open It's an insult to the people you're asking to commit to something. Exactly. You need to have time, right. you need the money, right. investment, you right. got to go all in and so push I, it. So I very much want to see it, and, and I, I want to encourage that here, but it's hard for me to look into the crystal ball and yeah. know, how, you know whether it's going to happen more or At less. At what point there are, are there too many projects? <laughs> you know, I mean, but I, I'm not, I don't mean this in, in, a, in a negative way, I mean it more in the way of, you, know, you mentioned supply chain, we were riffing on theCUBE about, at some point, there's going to be so much code, open source is continuing thundering away with, with the value, that you're just gluing things, right? It's, it's, I don't need the code, there's code there. Okay, what's in the code? Okay, maybe sure, automation yeah. can help out on supply chain. Yeah. But ultimately, composability is the new... Right, it is, yeah. And, way. And, and, and I think that's always going to be the that's case. Good it is a good thing. Um, and I, I think that's just, that's just the way of things, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Soon, no code, it will be 
I, I think we're thing. I think we're seeing a lot of no code situations that are working great for people. And and, and but this is actually really no different than my than my serverless argument yeah. from before. Just as a as a uh, a slight digression, I'm building something new right now, and you know we're using cloud native technologies and all this stuff, and it's still. What even, are you building? Even as a, I, I, I'm, I'm going to keep that, I'm going to keep that secret. No, no, for right. yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. But uh, <laughs> we'll find out. On Twitter <laughs> we're going to find out. Now crumbs. that we know, it. okay. Uh, uh, All right, you open, that, mystery. you open that door. We're going down. Yeah. Right. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Um, Front page of Silicon Angle. <laughs> but yeah. I, I was just going to say <laughs> that, you know, and, and I consider myself, yeah. um, you know, you're man, building I, something. I'm, I see myself an expert in the cloud native space. It's still difficult. It's difficult to. to pull together these technologies, and I think that we will continue to make it easier for What's people. What's the biggest difficulty? Can you give us some examples? Well, just, I mean, we still live in a big mess of YAML, right? <laughs> a, there's, a, there's a lot of YAML out there, <laughs> and I think just wrangling yeah. all of that in these systems, there's still a lot of cobbling together where I think that there can be unified platforms that make it easier for us to focus on our application logic. Yeah. I got to ask you a question because I talk to uh, college kids all the time. My son's a junior in CS, and he's you know he's coding away. What would you? How does a student or someone who's learning figure out where, who they are? Because there's now you know you're either into the infrastructure under the hood, yeah. or you're because that's coding there. Ops sure. are now coding away. Right. Your infrastructure people are working on say the, yeah. the boring stuff, so everyone else can have ease yeah. of use. And then what is just I want to just code. There's two yeah. types of personas. How does someone know who they are? My, when I give people career advice, my biggest piece of advice to them is in the first five to seven to 10 years of their career, I encourage people to do different things, like every, say, one to two to three years. And that doesn't mean like quitting companies and changing companies, it could mean you know, within a company that they join, doing different teams, um, you know, working on front end versus back end, because honestly, I think people don't know. I think it's actually very, yeah. Our industry is so broad yeah. that I think it's almost impossible to you know, get your hands to, to know, jump in to the know water. what you like. And for me, yeah. um, in my career, you know, I've dabbled in different areas, but I've always come back to infrastructure. You know, yeah. that, that's what I yeah. enjoy like the most. You got to taste, taste everything, see what you what you like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Last question for sure. you, Matt. It's been three years since you were here. Yep. What do you hope that we're able to say next year that we can't say this year? Hmm. Beyond yeah. the secrets of your project, which <laughs> hopefully we will definitely be discussing then. Um, you know, I, I I don't have anything in particular. I would just say that I would like to see more movement towards projects that are um, synthesizing and making it easier to use a lot of the existing projects that we have today. So, for example, <laughs> I'm yes. I'm very bullish on backstage. Like I I've, I've always said that we need better developer UIs that are not CLIs. Like I know it's a general perception among many people totally that agree with you, frankly. You're, you're not a real systems engineer unless you type on the command line. I, I think no. better user interfaces are better for humans. Yep. So just for a project like Backstage to be more integrated with the rest of the projects, whether that be Envoy or Kubernetes or Argo or Flagger, yeah. um, I, I just I think there's tremendous potential for further integration yeah. of some of these if projects. If there's composability, that makes total yep. sense. Yep. Mm -hmm. You're you're, yep. op you're operating and composing. Yep. And there's no reason that user experience can't be better and then more people can create and build. So I think it's awesome. Yep. Matt, thank you so much. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, this has been fantastic. Be sure and check out Matt on Twitter to find out what that next secret project is. John, thank you for joining me this morning. My name is Savannah Peterson, and we'll be here all day live from theCUBE. We hope you'll be joining us throughout the evening until uh, happy hour today. Thanks for, com thanks for coming. Thanks for watching.